Okay, hello everyone. Um, I'm very happy to be here. Uh, it's nice to be among uh, a large group that's so interested in patient-centered care and patient-centered research. And uh, I'm here to talk about patients like me. We tend to think differently about things, so you'll probably hear some things that may sound a little uh, offbeat. Um, has anyone ever heard of patients like me? Okay, has anyone been to the site? Okay, great. So I will um, start from scratch here and uh, give you an idea of uh, how the site is constructed, how we do research, how we engage patients, and I uh, would love to hear your comments and uh, questions. Okay, so what is patients like me? I always start by uh, talking about our patients. Uh, this is our team of advisors. And uh, these are people who have a variety of uh, chronic diseases. Um, they uh, come from backgrounds probably very similar to the advocates that uh, are working uh, in this hospital. Um, and we go through an application process. It's a, they have to answer some questions about how they view their care and uh, different aspects of health. And the first year we did this, uh, we got 500 applications. And we picked 14 people, because that's all we could manage. The second year, uh, we got 1,400 applications for 14. It's, it's easier to get into Harvard. <laughs> and we are about to uh, roll over the group. You know, we change it every year and go through this application process. And I'm really worried how many applications we're going to get. Um, I had to read 50 myself. Uh, we had to divide up uh, the work. But there's one thing we've been missing. We haven't had a Canadian representative yet. And I know we have some very, very qualified people here. And uh, we'd love to talk to you more about that. Um, uh, it's been pretty much US based. And it would be nice to have some international uh, exposure here. So patients like me, it's been around for 10 years. And it started uh, when um, uh, Stephen Haywood, who you see uh, sitting there, uh, contracted a ALS. And uh, his brothers, uh, Jamie and Ben, were, uh, who uh, are MIT engineers, uh, were trying to do research and understand the condition and find out uh, you know, what is going on with this disease from the patient perspective, and had a very difficult time locating information about the patient experience and, and different treatments and what people thought of those. And uh, they ended up uh, uh, building patients like me to be a place where people could actually share their medical data. Uh, so there's lots of data out there, uh, lots of data locked up in databases that patients never see. Um, there's lots of data that's uh, investigator driven um, or clinician driven. Um, our goal is to have patient-driven uh, data that they share with each other and that they evaluate with each other. Um, so uh, it started off with ALS and neurological disease, and over time it has expanded. And um, in 2011, it was opened up to uh, people with any disease, anything you could possibly want to talk about, report, uh, we'll accept. And uh, now it's, as you can see on the bottom, uh, we now have over uh, 400,000 patients. I just learned yesterday we're headed for 500,000, um, probably later in the year. And there's 2,500 conditions represented on the site. Um, we passed our 30 millionth data point. Um, we have uh, a lot of structured and unstructured data. Structured data is uh, gotten through uh, kind of an interview survey format. Unstructured is biographical information and forum conversations. Um, and uh, we have worked uh, with patients to uh, uh, gain insights about their you know, symptoms, treatments, and conditions. And uh, we've uh, been able to uh, publish a lot of this data. So uh, we are uh, interested in um, working with a broad range of, stock, of, of stakeholders. So uh, we have uh, pharmaceutical companies working with us. We have healthcare organizations. We're working with Walgreens. 
Um, this is how we fund the development of the platform, uh, our engagement efforts, our research. And uh, over time, uh, it, it's been a way to uh, really help get the message out about uh, patient-centered research to a wide variety of organizations. Um, we also work with uh, uh, academic uh, uh, research partners at a variety of uh, nonprofits and uh, you know, various academic centers. Uh, and we have been recently working with the Food and Drug Administration um, because they are interested in learning more about how patients look at their adverse events and what kinds of characteristics uh, come into play uh, with people who are reporting adverse events. So uh, we hope to move that uh, work forward. So who joins patients like me? Um, it's uh, heavily female. And uh, this is not unlike many uh, internet health sites. Uh, uh, females uh, have a somewhat greater tendency um, to uh, report these conditions and talk about health issues online. Um, uh, we have 16% uh, uh, minority participants. Uh, we, we tend to cluster somewhere uh, in, in the 40s. I think the average is around 48. It's a site for people with chronic disease. Our sweet spot are the diseases that are difficult to diagnose, um, difficult to treat. Um, people have to live with them every day. Um, uh, we, we don't really represent acute conditions uh, as well, although a lot of the people on our site certainly experience those. But what brings people and engages people is the fact that they have uh, chronic conditions that they've got to deal with every day and there's no avoiding it. Um, multiple comorbidities. Um, you know, when I just think about myself, you know, how many things are wrong with my body, you know? Uh, it's hard to have a perfect body. Um, and it's uh, really hard to only have one disease or one condition or one symptom. Most people have more than one. And certainly when it gets into a, a chronic disease situation, we've got people with three and four and five and six comorbidities. Uh, these are not the people that are ending up in clinical trials. They're getting ruled out. Um, they're not engaged in research efforts in many cases. Um, so we welcome uh, this, and we are very interested in how these conditions interact and how symptoms cross over between conditions. It's an English-speaking site. I wish it were in French. Um, it's 60% U.S., and I just looked up our Canadian contingent the other day, and we've got 13,000 Canadians uh, on our site. And I hope that we have more after today. Um, the site is free to patients. Um, there is no uh, charge for any activity. And I should also say that we, are, we have decided to try and engage patients um, without paying uh, for research, except in uh, you know, uh, highly um, burdensome, kind, you know, if, if there's a test that involves a little more burden than, than say, a typical survey. Um, but we, uh, we find that that really uh, does not uh, draw up the right motivations. Um, so we uh, are able to do this uh, without uh, having to pay people for research. These are the conditions on the site. I can tell you probably every single one of these numbers is wrong. Um, um, this is a slide I've been using for a few months. I have to update it. it these numbers are going to be higher. Um, but um, as you can see, uh, conditions like multiple sclerosis, fibromyalgia, um, uh, uh, the psychiatric conditions really fit within the profile that I was talking about in terms of difficult to diagnose, treat, and you know manage every day. Um, we are currently building out uh, our um, oncology community, uh, particularly in lung cancer. We're building out PTSD, uh, traumatic brain uh, injury, um, and we have, I believe, the largest um, community uh, of idio. Uh, pathic pulmonary fibrosis patients. Um, so, uh, you know, we really do uh, have a lot of representation um, across the various disease types. Um, we outreach through, you know, a lot of the typical uh, methods, uh, Twitter, Facebook, we do blogs. Um, we work with, uh, you know, uh, key opinion leaders, um, nonprofits. 
Uh, we have a couple of me uh, members who've achieved some uh, renown. Uh, one wrote a book um, called Napkin Notes. Uh, There's a gentleman who uh, uh, developed kidney cancer, and he decided uh, that he would write a note on a napkin every day and put it in his daughter's lunch for her entire high school career. And these were, uh, you know, motivational notes, sayings, uh, you know, helpful comments, advice. And he collected this into a book called Napkin Notes. Um, and um, I, I heard that Reese Witherspoon is going to turn this into a movie. Um, so, we, you know, we, we talk about some of these patients who are doing this. We have another patient who just came out with, uh, 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 put a movie together called um, Touch with Fire on bipolar disease. It was out in the theaters. I don't know if it made it here. Um, so we will promote those sorts of things. I have a... a a woman that uh, I've been talking to has MS, and um, she has decided to run a marathon on every continent in the next year. And I thought, I, I met with her, I had lunch with her, and I said, do you think you can do that? And she said, well, yeah, I've done 38 marathons, and I've never been able to, um, I've never not finished. And she walked with a fairly pronounced limp, her husband runs with her, and she somehow gets herself through these, so she's gonna do it. Um, so we like showing that people can overcome, um, you know, the challenges of their conditions. What do members do in the Senate? You hear this term, uh, democratization of information, um, and we all have gotten used to uh, sharing data and making decisions uh, based on data. Um, you know, uh, if we uh, want to find a great restaurant in Montreal, we can look on Yelp. And if we want to find a book, you know, we look at uh, people's ratings. You know, I want to buy a toaster on Amazon. I can see how people are living with that toaster, not just what the experts think. Um, and uh, if I want to do a trip, I can find out, you know, if there's cockroaches in that hotel. Um, you know, so the, um, uh, the information that we use is very data-driven. Except we don't often do that with our health. And we uh, have kind of left that to the professionals. And, and, you know, can patients actually produce their own data, use their own data, and even analyze their own data, even, maybe even do their own studies? And I think we saw some examples before. Of course they can. Uh, so we uh, want to provide a platform that allows people uh, to do that. And we will partner with them to uh, follow their journeys and try to use our expertise to help them learn even more from their own data. Uh, so there's three basic things that people do on our site. Uh, they learn, they connect, and they track. Um, so we provide a lot of information about conditions and symptoms, the, the kind of WebMD-ish information that, that's out there. Um, but you can also learn about that from aggregated patient data. And you can actually look at individual patient data if you are a patient. Um, uh, we try to connect people. We have an active group of moderators who uh, keep conversations going and keep people engaged. And uh, we help people track themselves over the time. So we want to help people create a longitudinal record and, and be able to compare what's going on with my symptoms, what's going on with my treatments, what's going on um, with other aspects of my life situation, and can I learn anything from looking at those things side by side. So as far as learning, I'll just show you a few um, uh, of the pages and how uh, there's, there's a lot of hyperlinking going on. In the corner there, you'll see a, a link for Data for Good. And we do what we call data donation campaigns. So we treat data as something uh, very important. And we treat data as something that you are, are uh, privileging us to, to view and, and allowing others to view. So we take that very seriously. And uh, we would, would like people to share their data, but we want to give data back too. Um, so. Uh, we really do see the importance of having that kind of exchange. If we look at the typical research contract, it is a one-way situation. 
the researcher collects the data and the patient is a, is a passive in, uh, passively involved in the research activity and often doesn't even know what happens at the end. And uh, there's a colleague of mine who uses the term uh, helicopter research, um, where the researcher flies in, collects uh, what he or she needs to collect, and flies away, and um, there's no kind of uh, longitudinal involvement between, or relationship between the researcher and patient. We're in it for life with people. We want to stay with you the whole time. Um, so uh, we, we need to make that commitment to you and, and to offer something of value to you um, in order to make it worth sh sharing that valuable data that you have. So um, you can uh, look up conditions. Uh, so I'm going to use major depression. Uh, I've been doing a lot of work in this area lately. And you can see there's uh, symptoms listed down the left side. Uh, you can see uh, the severity rating. This is patient reported. And um, what people are taking. Everything is hyperlinked. So I can look at a particular medication. I can look at a symptom and find out more about it. Um, and so, uh, so there's a lot going on under the, under the hood here. Um, I can look at uh, the treatments that people are receiving. So I can look at uh, the effectiveness, um, particular side effects that they're dealing with. If I want to learn more about the uh, side effects of Cymbalta, I can uh, cl you know, uh, click on a link and uh, dig in a little bit further. Um, I should say that uh, we allow people to enter d uh, information and data in their own language. There is, there is some structured feedback, in you know, survey-like, um, but we like people to use their own language. We have a team of um, health data integrity um, personnel. Uh, th uh, these are pharmacists and uh, nurses who uh, review this data. And if there's anything that looks out of sorts, a, a, a dosage that doesn't exist, a new symptom, um, it, they're going to try and code that to existing nomenclature, medical nomenclature. Uh, so that then when we pull that out uh, for research purposes, you know, uh, we're comparing apples and apples. Um, but we now have amassed uh, a large uh, database of patient terminology, they, they call it folksonomy, um, uh, about uh, how they uh, describe their conditions and symptoms. Something happens when you allow people to define things. So if I said to uh, professionals in general, what's a treatment? They're going to think of a therapy, a medication, some sort of formal uh, delivery of an intervention. Uh, when you ask patients uh, what a treatment is, you get a much broader picture. And because, you know, they might take the medication, it might work, it might not. But they got to live day to day. They have to figure out the, the tricks of the trade to get through the day. And uh, they find very, you know, people find very creative ways of coping. Um, so they, you know, uh, you know, we hear that people think of treatments much more broadly than professionals do. So one of the most popular treatments is a handicap parking permit. Um, and it's something, anything that helps a person cope can be considered a treatment. Uh, we hear about pets. Um, and, you know, we cannot ignore these uh, types of, uh, uh, you know, helpful tools uh, because, um, you know, uh, we know that medications can be very effective, but they may not do uh, the whole job. And there are other things that people are finding that are very helpful. And they can share that with other people. Um, and they do. We have a lot of cat pictures. Um, side effects. Um, so uh, you can learn, you know, see more about the side effects, and uh, importantly, why people start and stop uh, certain medications. The attributions that uh, the patients see for starting and stopping may not match the professionals. Um, a, a colleague of mine said, uh, "There's, um, you know, uh, provider reality." There's patient reality, and then there's reality. And 
um, you know, we need to think about all of the pieces uh, that we need to put together to really understand what is going on uh, with these chronic conditions. Um, we have people connect, so we have a very active um, forum. We have probably 15 major disease communities. Uh, uh, if when people people designate a primary condition and uh, they get invited into uh, particular communities, and these groups are large, we have uh, you know a lot of lurkers, uh, and we have a lot of participants, and. Uh, our moderators uh, help out with the research because they can tell us what's hot, you know, what's going on these days. What are people talking about? How are they talking about it? What are the trends? And uh, this helps keep us up to date on, you know, what matters uh, to the, the patients on our platform. Um, we also have people uh, track themselves. Um, there are, this is a kind of overview of the data structure of the site. Uh, so people can put in basic information. You we only need one piece of information for you to become a member, your email address. Then people can put in as much or uh, as little as they like. Uh, some people uh, will go in every day, and we have these incredible records. Um, and some people may choose to be in the forums. Um, some people may choose to just check things out. That's all fine with us. Um, so we learn about the diseases, uh, what their disease journey is. I've heard the term journey being used. So we use that word a lot. Um, uh, we ask about uh, symptoms, um, when they started, how severe they are, the treatments that they're using, again, broadly defined, quality of life. We have particular uh, disease-related outcome measures, uh, Parkinson's and MS and, and that sort of thing. And then we have other data that involves more narrative text. We ask uh, biographical information. Um, we, you know, if you've stopped a medication, you know, uh, we, well, it might, you know, we ask you to comment on that. We might ask you to comment on what works for you. Um, and then lately, uh, we've been including uh, wearable data. So people who have, uh, right now it's just Fitbits, can upload their Fitbit data um, onto the site. And um, we are uh, very interested in seeing if there are digital signatures in terms of people's activity level in relation to their symptoms and disease types. Um, so uh, we're hoping that, you know, because we have this patient reported data in line with uh, sensor data, and we'd like to expand the types of sensors we, we're including, um, that, that we can generate that picture. We are also doing pilots to integrate genomic uh, and other data, like medical record data, um, into the system. So uh, we're hoping to build out uh, the, the type of information right now. It's, it's basically a self-report setup right now. This shows you what a profile might look like, uh, you know, from uh, you know the, the patient point of view, and. Um, you can look at the relationships between, uh, you know, a person's condition, the treatments, the symptoms. This MSRS uh, is a multiple sclerosis rating scale. The lower is good. Uh, you can see the person's uh, feeling better. Um, and that seems to correspond with the introduction of uh, a, a new medication. Um, so, so that's an observation. Um, although we still see some issues around, at the bottom around uh, fatigue. Um, and, uh, you know, the, uh, the person seems to be feeling a little bit better in terms of mood, uh, if you look at that last data point. So it allows you to kind of track yourself over time and to compare different dimensions of uh, your disease experience. In terms of our research, um, you know, we, we have uh, a lot of commercial work going on right now. We have uh, uh, we're involved with a variety of uh, grants, and we are involved with our own grants. Uh, we, are, we have a Robert Wood Johnson grant uh, to develop a uh, patient-centered approach to uh, um, performance measurement in medical care. Uh, typically, that's been uh, investigator-driven, and we'd like to hear more about how patients rate the effectiveness of their health care. Um, so, we uh, like the journey metaphor. This is a uh, page showing the components of one wearable study uh, we did where we uh, uh, had MS patients wearing Fitbits uh, over a period of time. 
And these are all the pieces that went into place to conduct that study. Uh, we actually, Fitbit has very nice materials, but they're not set up for chronic disease. We actually uh, reboxed it and put uh, more patient-oriented instructions in it. Uh, we had a, a point of contact. Um, you know, we've got the research components. We use IRB in our studies. We tell patients always who is the sponsor of this research and what's being done with this research. And uh, we uh, want people to uh, really understand the value uh, for them. Um, and if we have, we might have to uh, change uh, the data architecture if we're adding new data points. Um, and then we go through a whole messaging campaign uh, to recruit people. Most of the people that we, we recruit for our studies are right from our patient base. We tend not to have to go outside uh, unless it's uh, representative of a group that uh, you know, we don't really have. Um, and then we might do um, you know, uh, Facebook recruitment or whatever. Um, I'm going to show you just some quick examples of some of the research uh, that we do. And because we are not focused on a single disease, it gives us the opportunity to look at how the patient experience uh, is played out across diseases. So what you're looking at here, uh, we have something called a mood map, which is basically a symptom uh, checklist uh, of different psychiatric symptoms. And on the side, uh, you have uh, the various disorders. On the bottom, you can see some of the symptoms. And uh, our data, we have a data science group in addition to our, uh, anal, uh, you know, our uh, epidemiology group. And uh, this is a heat, what's called a heat map. And it shows you what symptoms uh, occur more intensely uh, based on certain conditions. So red is showing you conditions that are, you know, have greater severity. The blue is uh, less uh, severe. And um, it allows us to look at a particular symptom and how it can be played out uh, across uh, diseases. We are learning that all symptoms are not created equal. There are certain symptoms of diseases that clinicians might find very critical. Um, and what happens in clinical trials is uh, th there may be certain outcomes measured that may not be uh, as important in the real world. So we are very interested in learning what outcomes people uh, find important. And we, and, and we hear about things like fatigue and insomnia. And in depression, you know, we hear about a symptom like uh, anhedonia, the inability to experience pleasure. It seems to be a real uh, marker uh, for other problems. Um, so uh, we're very interested in looking how that plays out. Now, I, do we have any psychiatrists here? No psychiatrists. Okay. I'll say this anyway. Um, so there's this book called the DSM-5. Um, and some of us think it's a wonderful, it's a, it's a psychiatric uh, diagnostic manual. Some of us think it's a wonderful work of fi uh, fiction. Um, and um, uh, the head of NIH, NMI, NIMH, uh, the previous head, uh, had some serious doubts about it, such that NIMH is now investigating uh, symptoms across diseases and trying to get outside of rigid diagnostic classifications. So how do these symptoms get played out um, across conditions? And particularly in psychiatry, you have a lot of um, comorbidity among conditions and a lot of sharing of symptoms across conditions. Let's look at how those symptoms are expressed. So um, anyway, th I, we think there's some, uh, something to be gained uh, by this sort of analysis. Uh, we do uh, surveys. Uh, because we have a large group uh, 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 in many diseases, we can recruit pretty quickly. Um, this is what we called uh, an all-at survey. It's, it went out to everybody. We had 5,000 uh, people uh, participate in this. And we were able to compare the experience of insomnia across conditions. You can see that bottom left uh, chart. Um, uh, less of an issue in uh, ALS um, compared to something like uh, fibromyalgia, lupus, bipolar disorder. Um, we also found that uh, when you use the term insomnia, many people think that just refers to falling asleep. And uh, many people experience um, disruption in sleep during the night and may not call that insomnia. <clears throat> uh, we are putting together a global trial access data bank. 
Um, there's a lot of interest in how patients view uh, clinical trial methodologies and logistics. So uh, we are uh, trying to learn more about what people value in terms of uh, clinical trials, what might help them to get, get them to participate, and what might enhance uh, retention in clinical trials. Um, now, typically, this is talked about globally, but we're finding disease variation again. Um, there, there are different aspects of uh, the clinical trial experience that may be important or uh, less important, depending on what your condition is. So uh, we're able to, uh, we, you know, we have this dashboard. We're able to cut the data uh, based on a variety of vari variables. You see those on the left. So we uh, are hoping to do more with that. We've been doing more conjoint analysis with um, trial data. Um, wearable research, I mentioned this already. Uh, this was a study for Biogen a couple of years ago. And uh, we uh, recruited, we were hoping for 50, 70. We got 250 in a day who signed up. Um, and 80% uh, stayed in the study. This is two years ago. We still have 50 people authenticating their data. So we have two years of uh, wearable data with, uh, for MS patients. We're going to be looking at that to see, again, can we detect any kind of digital signatures based on uh, MS subtypes? Um, we are interested in, in uh, developing patient-reported outcome instruments. We had a Robert Wood Johnson grant to develop online capability for this. Uh, we were able to uh, work with external researchers to develop 12 new measures in a year. We even had a patient develop one with the help of our psychometrician. Um, we're moving towards publication uh, with the patient on that particular uh, paper. Um, the, uh, the tool that we have also allows the investigator to look at the psychometric characteristics of the items, help them choose the items that are most, uh, the patients are responding to the, the best, and develop scoring. Free text, as I said, uh, on our, plat on our uh, forums, there's a lot of conversation. Um, our data scientists have gotten interested in machine learning and other kinds of qualitative analysis. So we wanted to find out uh, w uh, what kinds of uh, uh, symptom reports correlated, uh, particularly in relation to flares or relapses um, with MS. And you can see the overlap between um, references that people make. Um, lots of fatigue, um, cognition, um, and pain uh, in this group. Um, so, uh, you know, we hope to do, uh, this is just a simple uh, chart, but, we're, you know, we're hoping to do more in-depth analyses uh, over time. We're doing concept mapping and using different statistical techniques that are qualitative. Um, we believe uh, in continuous patient engagement. Uh, so uh, we like the idea that patients provide the ideas, that they help participate in the research, they help us understand the data, and they even take it all the way through to um, receiving the data, which we call a give back. This is a give back that we used in, in our insomnia study. And uh, we are interested in having patients even participate in publications. And I've sat on panels uh, um, with uh, some of our mem members. Uh, one member was sharing his insomnia data, and, and we presented at a medical informatics conference. Uh, so that, that, that was definitely of interest and uh, received very well. I, I hope more of that is done. And we publish. Um, we try to do open access so that anyone can get at the publications. And um, we uh, are interested in uh, trying to um, really involve patients in that process uh, as much as we can. That's it. <laughs>